Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to the House, Honourable House Leader of the Official Opposition for raising this point of order yesterday, objecting to the unusual procedures that were accepted within the Standing Committee on Finance in relation to the clause-by-clause -clause treatment of Bill C-60, the 2013 Omnibus Budget Bill. Prior to his point of order, Mr. Speaker, I was struggling with the dilemma in that I was certain there was an effort to undermine my rights as an individual member of Parliament, and yet there had been no formal challenge, and I wasn't sure how to approach, Mr. Speaker, to put before you the ways in which I found that procedure unacceptable. And I really very much appreciate the official opposition saw fit to raise its concerns about those procedures, and they, the procedures adopted, novel procedures, mind you, before the Standing Committee on Finance did not comport to parliamentary rules and practice and went beyond the mandate of the committee. I agree with all the points made by the Honourable House Leader of the Official Opposition and by the member for Winnipeg North on behalf of the Liberal Party. Before getting down to the particulars of the current situation, I wish to review some fundamental principles related to the matter before you, Mr. Speaker. In essence, what you are asked to adjudicate here is an effort by a powerful government party with the majority of seats in this place to eliminate what few rights exist to influence legislation in the hands of only eight members of parliament, belonging to two recognized national parties, myself on behalf of the Green Party and members here for the Bloc Québécois, plus two members currently sitting as independents. Within this group, the government party's efforts are aimed only at the Green Party and the Bloc Québécois. We are the only members to have submitted amendments at report stage in the 41st parliament. The appropriate balance between the majority and minority in proceedings of the House is, as Speaker Milliken noted, a fundamental issue. And Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be providing the written copy of this presentation to you so that I will not have to read out loud all the citations. But the following passage is very apt. Although Speaker Milliken was dealing with a situation with a minority parliament, the issues before him of balancing the rights of the minority and the majority are the same. And I quote from Speaker Milliken's ruling of April 23rd, of rather March 29th, 2007. Quote, at the present time, the chair occupants, like our counterparts in House committees, daily face the challenge of dealing with the pressures of a minority government. But neither the political realities of the moment nor the sheer force of numbers should force us to set aside the values inherent in the parliamentary conventions and procedures by which we govern our deliberations. Quote, continuing, unlike the situation faced by committee chairs, a speaker's decision is not subject to appeal. All the more reason then for the chair to exercise its awesome responsibility carefully and to ensure that the House does not, in the heat of the moment, veer dangerously off course. The speaker, continuing the quote, must maintain and must remain ever mindful of the first principles of our great parliamentary tradition, principles best described by John George Bourinot, clerk of this House from 1890 until 1902, who described the principles thus, quote, to protect the minority and restrain the improvidence and tyranny of the majority, to secure the transaction of public business in a decent and orderly manner, to enable every member to express his opinions within those limits necessary to preserve decorum and present unnecessary waste of time, to give full opportunity for the consideration of every measure, and to prevent any legislative action being taken heedlessly and upon sudden impulse. And there, Mr. Speaker, I close both the inner quote of former clerk for you know, as well as Pete Speaker Milliken's citation of it. As I noted yesterday, in particular, in your ruling related to the member from Langley's point of privilege, you said, quote, an unquestionable duty of the speaker is to act as the guardian of the rights and privileges of members and of the House as an institution. And you cited with approval these words from Speaker Fraser, quote, we are a parliamentary democracy, not a so-called executive democracy, nor a so-called administrative democracy. The last quote is from your ruling of December 12, 2012, which bears directly on the matter at hand. In that ruling, you dealt with an objection raised by the Honorable Government House Leader to inter alia 
my presentation of amendments at report stage. The Honorable Government House Leader presented a proposal that all my amendments at report stage should be grouped, and one motion should be selected as a quote-unquote test motion. Only if the test motion was adopted would any of the other amendments be put to the House. Your ruling was clear, Mr. Speaker. You cited House of Commons procedure and practice at page 250, quote, it remains true that parliamentary procedure is intended to ensure that there is a balance between the government's need to get its business through the House and the opposition's responsibility to debate that business without completely immobilizing the proceedings of the House. And you added, quote, the underlying principles these citations express are the cornerstones of our parliamentary system. They enshrine the ancient democratic tradition of allowing the minority to voice its views and opinions in the public square and in counterpoint of allowing the majority to put its legislative program before Parliament and have it voted upon." Close quote. You ruled then, Mr. Speaker, that my amendment at report stage on Bill C-45 could stand and be put to a vote in the House. You also set out some circumstances which would provide a potential procedure to provide me and other members in my position with a fair and satisfactory alternative to amendments at report stage. In my view, Mr. Speaker, the government House leader is now attempting to do indirectly that which he could not do directly. It puts me in mind of the finding of Mr. Justice Dixon in that landmark Supreme Court case of Amax Potash, in which Mr. Dixon said, quote, to allow monies collected under compulsion pursuant to an ultra-virus statute to be retained would be tantamount to allowing the provincial legislator to do indirectly what it could not do directly and by covert means to impose illegal burdens, unquote. I again underline that as the Honorable Opposition House Leader has put before us, the actions of the Finance Committee were ultra-virus, and the whole effort here is to do indirectly what they can't do directly, uh, speaking of the Conservative Party efforts to suppress the rights of minority members. It offends principles of fairness to use the superior clout and power of a majority government to crush the few procedures found within our rules and traditions which I, as an individual member, have a right to recourse. It is clear that the effort being made by the Finance Committee on Bill C-60 is a continuation of the strategy by stealth of the government House leaders' efforts to foreclose democratic rights of members, which was attempted in November of last year. For the remainder of my argument, I would like to canvas, Mr. Speaker, two areas of facts that are relevant to the specifics of the question before you. One, was the procedure adopted by the Finance Committee in conformity to your ruling of December 12, uh, 2012? And have the amendments I have put forward in the 41st Parliament offended the rules by failing the tests of, quote, repetition, frivolity, vexatiousness, and unnecessarily prolongation of report stage, unquote. Dealing with the second point first, Mr. Speaker, I have moved amendments at report stage on the following bills, and I'll tell you how many amendments per bill. Bill C-10, 36 amendments. C-11, 11 amendments. C-13, 1 amendment. C-18, 3 amendments. C-19, 3 amendments. Bill C-31, 23 amendments. C-316, 5 amendments. C-38, 320 amendments. C-37, 1 amendment. C-43, 21 amendments. C-45, 82 amendments. What is immediately obvious is that the number of my amendments was directly proportionate to the legislation proposed by the government. Only on the two omnibus budget bills, C-45 and C-38, and the omnibus crime bill, C-10, did I propose a relatively large number of amendments. There were many amendments because the omnibus bills involved changes to multiple laws in a dramatic and transformative fashion. The amendments I proposed were all serious. None were frivolous. They were not of the kind, for example, put forward by the opposition of the day to the Nisca Treaty, in which multiple amendments were mere changes of punctuation with the goal of slowing passage of the Nisca Treaty. The amendments I have put forward have even gained favorable commentary from some government members. 
On C31, the Honourable Minister for Citizenship said, quote, I appreciate the member, speaking of, of, of me as member for Saanich Gulf Islands, I appreciate the member's evident concern and the fact that she takes the deliberative legislative process very seriously. On Bill C-11, the Copyright Modernization Act, the Honourable Minister for Heritage said, quote, I compliment her for her substantive approach to this legislation. And on Bill C-43, the Minister of Citizenship said, I commend the Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands for her constant due diligence. I know it is a particularly cha particular challenge to effectively be an independent member and yet participate in an informed way in debates on virtually all bills in the House. We all admire her for that, even if I do not agree with the substance of her intervention here." Close quote. In summary, Mr. Speaker, the amendments that I have put forward in the 41st Parliament have never been frivolous. Were they designed to slow passage? Not at all. Even on the day we began the marathon session of votes on amendments at Bill C-38, I approached the Prime Minister personally and asked if any compromise were possible. I told him I would be at his disposal, that if one or two amendments might pass, perhaps the rest could be withdrawn, that I was open to suggestion. My goal throughout was serious and grounded in principle. My constituents care about these issues and these bills. I am working tirelessly in their interests. I have never engaged in preparing and presenting amendments for the sake of, as the government House Leader has suggested, political gains or delay for delay's sake. Having worked in the Mulroney government and in public policy work in Ottawa dealing with federal governments and federal ministers and federal laws since 1978, I have personal experience with what used to be the normal approach to legislating in the Parliament of Canada. This particular administration is the only one in our history to enforce rigid discipline on its members in legislative committees. It is the first administration in Canadian history to resist any changes in its legislative proposals from first reading to royal assent. Even those errors that are discovered prior to passage are protected from amendment until subsequent bills correct earlier drafting errors. Worsening this abuse of democratic process, virtually every bill in the 41st Parliament has been subject to time allocation. Now, if it were not that time allocation was applied in the normal round of debates, eventually those members such as the, myself as seen as a, an independent for my rights and privileges, although I sit here as a Green Party member, in the normal course, eventually, members in my situation will be recognized to participate in the debates. But due to time allocation, there is never an opportunity to actually speak at second reading or at report stage or at third reading. With time allocation, there is never an opportunity for members in my position to make a speech unless another party cedes a speaking slot. As a matter of practical reality, the only way to have a speaking opportunity in such time-constrained circumstances is to have amendments tabled at report stage. This approach of the current uh, Conservative administration of rejecting any and all amendments while simultaneously abbreviating debate opportunities is a perversion of Westminster parliamentary tradition. It is a new and hyper-partisan approach to the legislative process. As a member of Parliament, I believe it is my duty to work to resist this new contemptuous approach to legislating. The ability to table amendments at report stage and to offer the entire House an opportunity to improve bills before third reading is even more critical when the Legislative Committee process has ceased to function as it did in all the time of all the speakers before you. Now I turn to the question, Mr. Speaker, of how the Finance Committee applied the suggestions contained in your ruling of December 12, 2012. And I note, Mr. Speaker, that the Chair of the Finance Committee is never anything but personally fair, and all members of the Finance Committee, I mean nothing personally towards them. I assume that this entire stratagem emerged elsewhere than from the members of the Finance Committee themselves. I note that you suggested, Mr. Speaker, that there are, quote, opportunities and mechanisms which are at the House's disposal to resolve these issues to the satisfaction of all members in a manner that would balance the rights of all members. Members need only remember that there are several precedents where independent members were made members of standing committee. Those are all quotes from your ruling in December, Mr. Speaker. And finally, you suggested, quote, were a satisfactory mechanism found that would afford independent members 
an opportunity to move motions to amend bills in committee, the chair has no doubt report stage selection process would adapt to the new reality." Unquote. From these comments, Mr. Speaker, it is clear your direction suggested that an effort be made to engage members with rights of independence, to enter into a discussion about how arrangements could be reached that were, in fact, satisfactory. To be, quote, satisfactory to all members, unquote, your ruling implicitly requires that the suggested opportunities and mechanisms be discussed and accepted by all concerned. Further, you suggested that temporary membership was possible, and further, that members should be able to, quote, move motions, close quote. Mr. Speaker, none of that occurred. I am attaching to a, a written copy that I will provide to the table all the correspondence between myself and the chair of the Standing Committee on Finance. There was, as you will see, no discussion or offer of cooperation. The quote-unquote invitation contained in a letter of May 7, 2013, left no room for discussion. The attached motion of the committee was supported only by the Conservative members of the Finance Committee, but not by the official opposition nor the Liberal Party members. The letter, and particularly the motion itself, had the tone of a unilateral ultimatum. My response was to ask for temporary committee membership for the duration of clause-by-clause -clause review. This request was rejected in the letter of May 24, 2013. As the various sections of Bill C-60 had been distributed among several committees, I attempted to attend all the hearings relative to my amendments. But committees were meeting at the same time in different locations throughout the parliamentary precinct, making it impossible to get to each one of them. I did attend meetings of the Industry Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Foreign Affairs Committee prior to Clause by Clause. I asked for permission to ask witnesses questions and was denied in the Finance Committee, and I was denied in the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was allowed to pose questions in the Industry Committee in a three-minute opportunity. To be blunt, Mr. Speaker, my opportunities were not close to equivalent to members of those committees. On Monday, May 27, 2013, as requested by the Finance Committee, I complied with the committee and attempted to cooperate. I submitted my amendments and attended clause by clause throughout the meeting of the committee on Tuesday, May 28, 2013. I asked for time to present my amendments, 11 in total. I was given half as much time as my colleague from the Bloc Québécois. I was allowed one minute per amendment. He was allowed two minutes per amendment. I attach the answers from all these discussions to abbreviate the recitation of the facts here. I prefaced my presentation of amendments with a statement that I had not asked for this quote-unquote opportunity nor invitation and that while I was attempting to cooperate, it was without prejudice to my rights to submit amendments at report stage. Each time I was given the floor for 60 seconds, I repeated that my participation was without prejudice to my rights to present amendments at report stage. When I have the right to move my own amendments, speak to my own amendments, answer questions about my amendments, and at report stage, I have the right to vote on my amendments. I also supported the point made by the Honourable Member from Parkdale High Park that, quote-unquote, inviting independent members to committee, in her words, quote, does not conform with parliamentary procedure in that only the House of Commons can appoint committee members, close quote. I noted that I did not have an equal opportunity to present my amendments. This observation was compounded as we went through clause by clause. On two occasions, members of the committee suggested amendments to my amendments. I was not allowed to comment on those suggestions. On one occasion, a member of the government benches disagreed with a point I made, but I was not allowed to reply. On another occasion, the NDP members misunderstood the impact of my amendment, but I was not allowed to explain. I was not allowed to move my amendments. The motions were deemed moved. I was not allowed to vote on my amendments. As noted, I was not allowed even the ability to participate in discussions about my amendments. There is no way, Mr. Speaker, the word satisfactory can be so twisted of meaning as to apply to the set of circumstances to which I was required to submit. It is a principle of fairness and natural justice, 
that an opportunity that cannot be used is no opportunity at all. When one considers the circumstances in which speakers have ruled that members did not have an adequate opportunity to submit their amendments, it is clear that this, this imposed process before the Standing Committee on Finance far, falls far short of the mark. For example, Mr. Speaker, in 2001, Speaker Milliken ruled that where a member was on two committees and had difficulty getting to the meetings, he could move amendments at report stage. Speaker Milliken wrote, quote, the member maintains that he sits on two committees, both of which were seized with bills at the same time and therefore had difficulty in moving his amendments. The chair will give the benefit of the doubt to the member on this occasion. In a situation where a member of a recognized parliamentary party attended the clause by clause of the committee, but was not an official member of the committee, Speaker Milliken allowed that member's amendments to be presented at report stage. He noted, quote, of course the chair recognizes that our parliamentary system is party driven and that the positions of the parties are brought forward to committees through its officially designated members. The chair also recognizes that some members may want to act on their own. Underscoring this, Mr. Speaker, what an example. A member of a recognized party with rights to participate in standing committees chose to be in the meetings in clause by clause, could have handed that member's amendments to another member of his party and asked them to be submitted, but the Speaker of the House supported the right of that member to amendments at report stage because he was not a committee member. I was a long, long way from the rights of that member of a recognized political party sitting in that committee back in 2003 when Speaker Milliken allowed that member's amendments at report stage. Mr. Speaker, the right of a member to actually move the amendment to committee cannot be perverted through the expedient measure imposed by a majority party of demanding all amendments of an independent member be submitted, deny that member the right to move the amendment, speak to the amendment other than in an inadequate, perfunctory fashion, debate or defend their amendments, have no opportunity to speak to other amendments, and deny the member any chance to vote on their motion. There may well be some way to accommodate members of Parliament in my position, but clearly this experiment on Bill C-60, a clause by clause in the Finance Committee, is not acceptable. To accept it now, Mr. Speaker, and disallow, disallow rights of members of Parliament in the position of independence to submit amendments at report stage will be to create a precedent that fundamentally abuses our foundational principles of Westminster parliamentary democracy. Mr. Speaker, I urge you to find in favor of the point of order put forward by the Honorable House Leader of the Official Opposition and to set aside the treatment of myself and the member from the Bloc Québécois and allow us to submit amendments, move amendments, debate our amendments, and vote on them on Bill C-60 at report stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.